Depeche Mode had probably been going, as far as the media were concerned, as far as I was concerned, no more than nine months, maybe ten months. And Dan said, I've got to tell you some news. Vince is leaving the band. I went, I don't, he can't be leaving the band. We've only just got there. We've just had three hit records. And Vince is leaving. My initial reaction was hell. There was, is he coming back? Is he not? Has he gone for good? The deed was done. Yeah. It's like packing a new girlfriend, you know. You can't go back, you know. Yes, he's definitely gone for good. Then there was a period where, from our side of stuff, do you think Depeche are going to continue? I think at Prance, people were, well, they're, they're just going to implode now. Because, you know, what's going to happen? There's not going to be, there's not going to be a Depeche mode. And people, I remember people being very interested in what Vince was going to do and Vince's next project. He announced it at such an, an odd time. I, I, I'm not even sure if the album had been released. It's like, what the hell are you doing? You know, you've got the sort of opportunities that most people would kill for. I was just being a miserable bastard, you know. I think that they knew that I was going to do something. We started bickering and there were more arguments, especially when we were in the tour bus. And I just got fed up with it, really. He came to me and he said, you know, I, I don't think this is something I want to do and I don't like all the questions we get asked. I don't like doing interviews, I don't like doing TV, I didn't like touring. You know, he said all these things. And I was like, Vince, that's that's what we're going to be doing. I think the band were, were really pissed off. I know they were, you know. I think because I, I they felt I'd left them in the lurch. I think he just felt that he could and do it on his own. When I made the decision to leave the Pesh, it was, um, I know I did think that we, I wouldn't be recording again. I was going to get a job, actually. But I did a demo of Alison Moyer, played it to Daniel, and Daniel just about showed enough interest. And then the next thing we knew was, you know, Vince and Alison, and we had this, you know, as a PR company, we had Yazoo to kind of contend with and work with as well. The success of Yazoo was incredible. It was very difficult to think that one day, at this time, uh, Depeche, in fact, will be one day much bigger. In some ways, for Mute, it must have been a blessing because, you know, Vince went on to become successful. Yeah, you don't need them. You don't yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was probably Daniel who actually yes, told him to leave. <laughs> Daniel was kind of, I don't know whether by design or by accident, was fairly good at shepherding the situation. Everybody was knocked back, but I don't think anybody felt that it was the end of the band. In, felt, in fact, the band in particular felt, were very determined to, to move on, you know. I remember Dan's exact word. He said, it's gonna be all right, Neil. Don't worry, it's gonna be all right. Um, Martin can write some songs. <laughs> And I thought, oh God, what are we doing? He really didn't sort of uh, worry us that much. He should have worried every other band when your main songwriter uh, departs. But we didn't even think about it. It was just, we're carrying on, yeah. We discussed what we were going to do about replacing Vince, and we thought, or the band thought, that there wouldn't be a straight replacement initially because to, to kind of draft somebody into the band, but they needed an extra keyboard player for live. We put an advert in The Enemy uh, for uh, synthesizer player under 21. I had been in and out of several bands um, in the period leading up to my joining. At that time, I was just sort of looking around for another job, something that was going to pay the wages. And there was this advert in, in the Melody Maker, 
and I kind of almost knew who it was immediately even though it didn't say from the advert because I'd just read somewhere the week before that they'd lost a member and I thought oh, it's probably Depeche Mode you know um, even though I didn't know that much about them at the time. We auditioned at Blackwing usual and all these you know strange and wonderful characters showed up and um, they were all you know dressed up to the nines but couldn't play and um, then Al came along and could play anything. We thought we'd really get him by like asking him to play like a, you know, a bass line and a melody at the same time and you know he uh, did it and we were like wow this guy's like amazing. When I went to the uh, initial audition it did seem very simple what they were asking me to do you know very simple one line tunes and a bit of backing vocal but apparently many people had struggled to do that and I didn't. And I think they were a bit intimidated by him as well because he was such a good keyboard player. You know, they were, they were struggling playing the notes. He was just kind of, you know, reading the newspaper and playing at the same time. So he was in and I think we paid him some ridiculous amount, like 100 quid a week or something. You know, you know we gave him 100 quid a week for like the first couple of years, till he finally turned around and was like, you know, I'm in, am I in the band? He, though it wasn't initially apparent, it was, it was a steadying hand. It was more like a band who were together than three guys and Vince who wasn't having a good time. So in that sense, the machine was not broken, it was just changed. Charlie Wilder's first gig. Wasn't that at Crocs? Um, he played at Crocs, yeah. And then, within the space of days, I think, we were whisked off to New York to play a gig, and I think that was the first sort of proper gig. We did Top of the Pops and then got Concord over for our first gig, so we didn't go on stage at the Ritz till three o'clock in the morning. None of our simps were working. Dave, meanwhile, had uh, decided to have one of his tattoos removed and it had all, all gone septic. So we had a lead singer, a dancing lead singer with a septic left arm, like in a sling. <laughs> so it didn't look very good. And uh, I remember we came off and, um, and uh, it was really tight. It must have been about five o'clock in the morning we got out of that place and uh, the, the Ritz. And this bloke shouted to us, what happened to you guys? You used to be good. <laughs> we all, all of us all remember that comment and feeling really down. And it was just one of those tours, you know, it was just, just um, it wasn't that successful. It, it was just, you know, and it, we just honestly thought that our music would never ever be uh, compatible with what the Americans want. The other three decided that they wanted to make a broken frame on their own, otherwise it would have been perhaps perceived that Alan was just pulling the strings as people thought Vince was. So people got confused and I think a lot of fans thought that after the first bout of touring Alan had left because the album came out and he wasn't mentioned on it. But for them it was the best move because they wanted to prove that they, you know, they could do it on their own. I think to a certain extent there, there was, we don't know what to do. And also he is not one of us. And I think individually, if you kind of consulted them, they would have all said, I think he should be a member of the group. But do it collectively and uh, you're into committee land. And you know, if anybody can muddy waters, the Depeche collectively can do that. We felt sorry for him that understood what they were doing, and uh, that was that. We went in the studio, and Martin was given the 
tall order to come up with like 10 songs. I hadn't really heard very many of his songs, but the others had and knew his potential. I think at the time I was quite excited about it. It was the obvious choice for me to take over because at that point Dave didn't even write songs. Well, Martin was in some ways a more experienced songwriter already than Vince. Martin had been writing songs since the age of 14 and he wrote some fantastic songs then, of which some of those songs he wrote then made it onto a broken frame. I knew Martin wrote good songs because I'd heard his previous band, Norman and the Worms. They were kind of quite unconventional. His taste is so oddball as well, I think that's reflected in his songwriting. It would have been weird doing Speak and Spell Part 2 with the nature of Martin's songs. They were much more complex melodically. I just don't think it would have worked to make that kind of record. So I think they definitely wanted to spread their wings and, and work in a different way. The technical side of it had moved on, so it was a bit easier to work. And if you recorded something on day one, which you didn't like on day four, then it, it was easier to go back and replace that. Whereas before, if you're on the eight track and you'd have bounced it in with some other sounds, you're kind of stuck with it. It was more sort of how we would record an album now because we hadn't been playing a lot of these songs live so uh, it was putting, some, putting them together from scratch. It was set up for a fall so, so people weren't expecting a lot of it. You know, your main songwriter's gone. Um, as I say, it was very, very tribal. A lot of people into lots of different kinds of music. So, you know, what Depeche Mode did, you know, within that area of music, people just said, oh, that's okay, but, you know, they're not going to have the big hits like they used to. Okay, this is See You. We didn't have a vision at all. We were sort of torn between being a pop band on Smash Hits and sort of a cooler alternative band. Peel was playing the band, Peter Powell was playing the band, Janice Long was playing the band. So in terms of the credible end of Radio 1, the, the after four o'clock going into the evening, the, where, where you wanted, as a, as a promotion man, you absolutely wanted your band to be embraced, they were embracing the band. It was more the, the guys in daytime radio who just didn't really kind of, didn't, didn't quite understand a band that were all keyboards. Neil knew that it was going to be really hard to get on, over on the radio, and of course they hated it. Um, by that time we were already hated by radio DJs and they would often comment on how doomy we were. When CU came out, I don't think it did in terms of trying to get to where I wanted to get, um, achieve very much more. Yeah, we got on the radio, yes, we did some TV, um, we probably did some TV in those days that we shouldn't have done, which I kind of felt was um, probably my fault, but I was so desperate to move the band forward and to get more people to know about them and to, 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 to break the band into a bigger arena, that we probably did stuff that you know, in, in retrospect, I probably would never have allowed them to do if I'd have been a few years older. We were just so young and stupid that we agreed to everything that anyone offered us. Yeah, you know, and there was always an argument, you know, goes out to so and so many million people. OK, we'll do it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Looking back, of course we overdid the real pop stuff, but it was sold to us that, you know, we really needed to do those things if we wanted to keep having hit records. And so we just did everything that came along. I mean, as time went on, we became a bit more choosy, but that fear of being forgotten, I think, was, was always there. See You, which was the first single from Broken Frame, was probably more poppy than the singles from um, Speak and Spell in a way, but a, a lot of the other songs on Broken Frame are much darker, like Franksy said. So, <clears throat> the video for See You wasn't particularly dark, was it? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> surprised me that it became as big as it became but from our side of stuff it was early days they still weren't kind of ready so we were in the comfort zone we're generally very sort of like pessimistic people 
but for a very short period we, f we felt a little bit invincible. And when Meaning of Love came out, we expected it to do even better. I remember it gone in the charts at number five. And you know, we sort of think it might go to number one and stuff. And when we came, we got off the airplane and got the chart, it was like gone down to 17. And that was our first jolt of failure, even though it still you know, got fairly high. It felt like a, a disappointment after See You. Everybody was a bit shocked by that, but it wasn't one of their best singles. Daniel thought that, uh, that Gallup must have made a mistake. <laughs> was a bit too teeny. I don't blame the, the press for not giving us much respect in those days. There was, you know, lots of like teen magazines around like smash hits and things like that. And, you know, we, we did a lot. The whole credibility angle, and I can't stress, you know, the importance of that as much. I mean, in those days it was vital. It was like, okay, we don't want to be interviewed, but we can put out a side of us that people are going to have to pay attention to. So artwork was the first kind of public sign of there is something more to this band. At the time, there were a lot of journalists who were all ex-art school, etc. So the link was being made. These guys, they might not make the music, but they're beginning to see, to be fairly savvy in other areas. Well, it was remarkable. I remember when I first saw the Polaroid, it was just unbelievable. And so after I processed them all up and Daniel came down to Rotherhithe here, to the studio. I popped down to have a look and I was just looking on the light box and I seeing these images, I just thought they were fantastic. I couldn't quite believe how strong it was. When we actually saw the cover, we thought it was quite a stunning picture. And it did go on to like, win, win awards. Well, it was Sleeve of the Year, wasn't it? And um, it's just an amazing picture. Fantastic picture. He made up for speaking spell. <laughs> I think it's one of the best things that we've done, actually. Probably the greatest colour photograph ever taken, I think. i would be egotistical enough to say that and say, OK, find me a better one. Brian had an idea for a photograph you know, of, of, of some person kind of breaking a, the frame of the photograph. But I think I consciously wanted to steer it more in that kind of Russian iconic imagery because it was something that I kind of liked the look of, Daniel was very much into. We did have heavy discussions about it. So I would say it was a, a complete collaborative uh, idea, really. Brian would just come to the studio and, and and talk about things, you know, and we wouldn't have a clue what he was saying because it was art, art talk, you know. We'd just go, yeah, I can see this, this the field, <laughs> you know. We'd go, go, all right, just do it, you know. <laughs> so we all set off in this location bus with my assistant, Stuart Graham, Jackie Fry, the lady who's going to be the peasant. And it was just pouring with rain, just horrible. But one thing you know in photography is that rain can be really good because when rain stops, the sky can become very interesting. We had hailstorms and rain and all sorts of stuff, but, you know, Brian's ego will probably tell you that, you know, he did it all himself. Only Brian. <laughs> and Martin Atkins said he, he came up on his motorbike. He said, well, I've got to go out and get lunch then, you know. So he rode off on his motorbike for lunch. Then the rain stopped. It was just one of those, as he would say, the magic was there, you know. It was the magic. It was the magic.
be honest with you, I think the songwriting has got so much better, it's so superior to the early days. It was not completely mature, the uh, personality of, uh, of uh, Martin at the, at the time of Broken Frame. It still seemed quite poppy. I think Martin's depth came a bit later. You know, for me, it really doesn't work as a whole because, you know, some of the songs I'd written when I was 16 and we were, like, you know, reinventing them as uh, electronic songs. You know, some of the songs we were uh, I was making up in the studio. Um, and, you know, I think it's probably, you know, for me, probably our worst album. It was so difficult for us at that time, in retrospect. First of all, we'd lost our main songwriter. The second album syndrome is that usually you get, like, slaughtered anyway, no matter what you do. Um, and we kind of made this moody, odd-sounding record. And maybe by going with something like Leaving Signs was quite a bit of a reaction to that, to get, go with something that was much more, sort of, which was darker, and, and that was kind of the beginning of their so-called darker phase, really, Leaving Silence, that carried on to this day. <laughs> silence I think that was a turning point for us and realized that maybe that was you know a, a way uh, to go forward leaving silence was kind of like a, a watershed that's where things started to come together where they started to take themselves fairly seriously we felt I think more comfortable in that mood that was definitely where Martin was melodically and I've always said and I've always thought Martin writes beautiful melodies um, I mean, lyrically, it's just a lot more melancholy. Put it to one side, this is not a pop group. This is not a band that's making three-minute crappy pop songs. This is a band that's got longevity. This is a band that you, you want to go and see live. Leaving Science came together really easily and we just got a groove going and it just felt right instantly. And then I think one of my favourite songs on the record is the, the Sun and the Rainfall. I love that song. It's a really good song but I, I'm a big believer that songs that are put at the end of albums you know, always get lost. And that's one, one particular really good song that I think gets lost because it's the last track of the album. They'd led the audience to their space as the key, but it was no problem. Now obviously, if their audience had decided they didn't like the tougher stuff, they could have been in a lot of trouble. But they didn't, so they were fine. People started to see things were happening, that they weren't going to disappear, that there was you know, uh, an intelligence at work, and that there was, you know, they were forging ahead in, you know, in their own direction, that they are you know, sort of breaking to their own territory at their own, their own pace. And, you know, it's this innate sense of time. It was becoming apparent that, you know, they were here to stay. 